this video we're going to study the history of genetics by going back to the first person to propose a model of how uh, uh, traits are passed from parents to offspring um, in a model that we still accept today. So Gregor Mendel in the uh, mid-1800s was really a monk. He wasn't, he wouldn't consider himself a scientist, but he did notice uh, patterns in how traits were passed through the generations of the pea plants that he grew in the monastery's vegetable garden. So just a little bit about pea plants. Uh, they are flowering plants that make pollen, and the, if you can take the pollen from one flower and, and sort of pollinate another flower of the species, then they will eventually, um, the sperm inside the pollen will fertilize the egg, and um, part of the flower will turn into this fruit, the pea, that we eat as nutrition. Um, and those peas contain the seeds of offspring that you can also plant and um, raise more pea plants that way. And so it's just a method for sexual reproduction. Um, but the pea plant is a wonderful model organism to study for simple genetics for kind of several reasons. Mendel got kind of lucky here, uh, but certainly you can easily control who mates with who by taking the pollen from one plant and brushing it onto another plant. Um, and you can even snip off the pollen so they make sure they don't pollinate anybody else. Um, as it turns out, you can even self-pollinate uh, pea plants. You can have uh, one plant serve as both the mother and the father, the sperm um, fertilizing its own egg, and so that can give you even more control as to uh, who's reproducing with who. Um, another advantage of pea plants is this idea that you can generate a large sample size. If you're trying to find mathematical patterns, then it helps to have many, many plants to look at uh, and many generations to study in his lifetime. Uh, third, as it turns out, Mendel didn't know this in advance, but pea plants have very many simple traits where one gene controls the trait and there are just two possibilities for that trait. So let's talk about some of his early observations and then we'll kind of talk about how he uh, made his conclusions. Um, uh, we'll kind of uh, use the example of flower color as one of the traits that he studied here. As it turns out, there were two types of flowers, purple and white. Um, he found that some of his purple plants were what he called pure breeds. If you self-pollinated a, a purple flower plant, which meant that again, it was sort of both parents at the same time, mom and dad. Um, some of those purple plants um, always 100% of the time made offspring who also had purple flowers. So if he called them pure breeds, we probably call them homozygous dominant these days um, with our modern understanding. Uh, there are also white flower plants. As it turns out, they were always pure breeds. So if you self-pollinated a white flower plant, it always made white flower offspring too. He called them again pure breed for the white trait, but um, in, the, in our modern uh, discussions, we'd probably call it homozygous recessive. And then there were some interesting purple plants that um, he called hybrids. So if you self-pollinated them, as it turns out, they kind of um, some of the times made purple flower offspring like themselves. In fact, most of the time, 75% of the time. Um, but sometimes he was able to produce the white flower offspring um, just by self-pollinating those hybrid purples. Um, in our modern understanding, we'd probably call them heterozygous. They carried the recessive white allele without showing it. But again, he didn't know any of that here at first, so let me erase that and let's just kind of keep thinking here. Um, maybe kind of a sensible experiment would be that if you knew you had pure breeds for purple, they always made purple offspring, wouldn't it be kind of interesting to cross them with pure breeds for the white flower color? Kind of, you could ask, who wins? And so that was maybe the experiment he ran next. What if I cross the pure breeds for purple and white? And you can imagine that you might possibly get lots of different results. Uh, maybe they all come out purple. Maybe they all come out white. Maybe some come out purple, some come out white. Maybe it's kind of a mixture of the two. So I tried to use like a paint program to make these kind of you know lavender color, half purple, half white. Um, as it turns out, none of these other three options happened. They always, always, always came out purple every time he ran the experiment. And so it seems as, as, as if almost purple would dominate white, but this is also kind of a curious finding because obviously this plant passed on the purple character, but what happened to the contribution of this white plant? And so maybe we could help investigate that question by also asking the question, are these offspring pure breeds like the original parent um, or are they hybrids? 
And remember that you could test that by self-pollinating the purple, uh, those plants. And so if you have this uh, plant kind of serve as both parents once again, what do you get? So it turns out you find that they're all hybrids. They're all heterozygous. They're all um, carrying the recessive allele for the white flower trait because, again, 25% of the offspring come out with white flowers. Um, so you could think of that as like 75% purple, 25% white. In case you ever see this, this ratio just means that for every three offspring that had purple flowers, one of them had white flowers or you can kind of add these together. Three fourths of them were purple, one fourth of them were white. All of those are same ways of saying the same thing. But that was a really important number for Mendel. Seeing that mathematical pattern, he was smart enough to really figure out what was going on here. And so let's kind of bring up um, just a brief summary of all three, all of those experiments, and then um, we can kind of talk about what he concluded. Remember that the pure breeds um, always produced purple offspring, and that when this uh, offspring self-pollinated with themselves, they produced um, all of these results here. So first rule, Mendel says, uh, proposes the law of dominance that one trait uh, seems to completely dominate the other when you cross two pure breeds. So in this case, there are two possibilities, purple and white, and it seems like purple completely dominates white. Okay, um, second principle, organisms always carry two copies of a gene. Um, I was kind of doing that before by writing this out, but you could fairly ask, how does Mendel know that? Well, this is kind of the cool thing. Mendel knows that from this part of the experiment here. He knows that if you kind of take what he knows now to be a hybrid plant and self-pollinate it with itself so that it's both parents, he would only get this ratio of 75% purple offspring if um, this uh, organism had two copies of the gene. Because maybe you would expect one fourth of them to get both of the dominant copies maybe uh, two-fourths of them to get a dominant or a recessive copy, and then one-fourth of them would get both recessive copies. You only get this result if organisms carry two copies of a gene. So everybody carries two copies, and his final rule is what we call the law of segregation. Um, uh, those two copies inside of each organism segregate or separate themselves when you pass on your, your genes to the next generation sexually. So everybody carries two copies, but you only pass on one of those two copies. And as it turns out, uh, when Mendel's work was rediscovered later in the 1900s, we were able to um, uh, support his understanding with further understanding of how chromosomes work in meiosis. So as it turns out, we sort of supported his ideas by saying, you know what, Mendel, you're right. Everybody does have two copies of a gene. Why? Because we carry homologous chromosome pairs that both carry the gene. So the reason why we have two copies is because of the homologous pairs. And the reason for the law of segregation is because during meiosis, those chromosome pairs separate from each other when in that first meiotic division, we separate or segregate the homologous pairs. And we end up just passing one of those copies potentially on to the next generation. So um, the final thing I would just say is that Mendel didn't just study flower color. He, he wanted to check to see if other traits in pea plants also worked this way. And really through painstaking research, he was able to confirm over and over and over again the different variations he saw in his pea plants all seemed to work in this same way. And that gave him confidence to say, okay, I think I've really discovered kind of a general pattern about how all traits work. And then later scientists picked up on his work to see if those, the, the same patterns worked in other organisms. So um, we're just trying to give you a brief summary of how we got started thinking about genetics. I really don't feel like you need to memorize Mendel's experiment. That's really not the point of this. We're just trying to give you a sense of the evidence that got us started understanding this. Um, and what we're going to do is I'll present the rest of Mendel's findings in a later video, but we just want to give you a chance to explore how, how you can do simple inheritance work with Punnett squares, which is an application of Mendel's work.